you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. Today we're going to introduce Michelle Kelly. Michelle's been on the National Show Jumping Squad. She was on the squad for Sydney 2000 for the Olympics. She's won multiple Grand Prix. She's also won the Australian Grand Prix. And as well as that, Michelle's got a Master of Exercise Science in Rehabilitation. And she works now on riders' physical and psychological reactions when they're under pressure. How are you today, Shelley? I'm very well, Glenn. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me on Course Chat. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Shelley, we normally start people off with a quote that they might use, an inspirational quote or a quote they use when they're teaching. Have you got something there for us? The most important quote that stuck with me was um, when I was younger, I was very lucky to be coached by Carl Urenak, a European coach that came over, and he used to always say, you ride your pace and your line. And I think that's been the most inspirational quote in because it's good for any discipline. So, yeah, your pace and your line always. That's a good one, Shelley. Now, talking about horses, how did you first start? What were your first memories of horses? My family originated at Colorina Bry in northwest New South Wales on big sheep and cattle properties. So I had the opportunity as a young age to be mastering cattle and sheep, working properties, going to the local pony club and pony club camps. So I guess we loved horses, and but we used horses as our work, and it was a wonderful way to begin my riding career. So, yeah, working on properties. Well, all that mastering and just the long hours in the saddle, I think it, it's a good way just to get the mileage in, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I have a bit of a saying to anybody that's just been, say, arena riding, which I feel a little bit sorry for them that they didn't have the opportunity to muster cattle. And I say, you know what you need? You actually need to go and chase kangaroos. Because <laughs> I think that's, that's important to get that basic reactive sort of riding in the beginning. The cow went one way and we went the other. We soon learned to sort of stay with the horse when it yes. decided to head off. Yes. yes, yes, I think so. I think so. All right. Now, from the mustering to going on, becoming a professional and riding at the level that you did, what made you, was it one change that made you have a career with horses or was it a series of events? What was your thought process? I think when my mother married my father, he was a businessman in Sydney, so obviously we then came and lived in Sydney. We always had horses. My mother began a riding school in Sydney and then she ran one of the biggest riding schools in Sydney, I told them it was at West Pennant Hills. I guess all through my school years, I assisted her with her, the girls that worked for her, in coaching and just general management around the riding school. So I've always been involved with horses, and I guess I just continued on from what she did. She was the founder of RDA New South Wales, so we worked. I really enjoyed working with the disabled. So, yes, I guess it was a continuation of my mum. She's very proud. Thinking about, you know, you teach people um, and people starting off in a career with horses, what do you think are the key ingredients, the skills that they need before they even start with horses, personality traits or skills that they need? You need to have an absolute love of horses. I think you need to have a lot of resilience. I think resilience is a very good skill to acquire. There's a lot of ups and downs. I think it teaches you a lot of skills. It was once uh, I had to do a lecture on the difference between academia and sport, and I said there was a huge correlation between the ups and downs, the failures, the successes. I always say riding horses teaches you to become a good loser. Um, <laughs> and I think things like that is, you know, not to sweat the small stuff, to enjoy it, but to actually build up a resilience. I think that's really important in show jumping and in life, so the two correlate quite well. Okay. And thinking, you know, not to sweat the small stuff, but teaches you to be a good loser. What's a time that you've thought, I've just got to get over this. I've just got to get on something that you may have lost or may have been disappointed with the result. Is there anything there that you can think of? 
I don't know whether I've actually ever been disappointed with the result. I was just so happy to be show jumping or eventing or dress art, whatever I was doing. It wasn't so much result. It was that I was enjoying what I was doing. But I can remember being on the 2000 Olympic squad and my horse was going quite well. He was young, so he probably was never going to actually make the team. But I was able to stay on him and train with the squad right up until 99. And then he was sold. So he was sold. I rode him for owners and he was sold for quite good money, which is what happens. And all of a sudden I went from jumping Grand Prix to the next thing I was down our back paddock jumping my daughter's little Welsh mountain pony over a cross rail. <laughs> and people were saying, <laughs> friends would call in and go, oh, my goodness, you have come from, you know, <laughs> the, the penthouse to the you-know-what. Yeah, and yeah. Um, it sort of all of a sudden it really hit me that, Oh, my goodness, yes. Yeah, yeah. I have to change tact here. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it grounds you a bit, doesn't it? Yeah. It did, yes. It, it put me right back down on the ground and thought, okay, <laughs> here we go, start again. Yeah. But I think that's one good thing about the sport is that you can – it's not like a lot of sports, you know, riders come up and reach their peak and then they sort of, you know, finalise, get a bit older, become unsound, whereas with horses you can – bring on horses that do well, that reach a peak, and then you can bring on another young horse and come up again and another young horse and come up again. Well, that's right. I mean, I think that's the sport. That's where the resilience, I always say, you're only as good as four legs underneath you. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, you know, if your horse is sold or it's gone, then you've got to start again. So you've got to remember that, you know, I think it's equally important. I think what what, as Grand Prix riders we have to realise is that for somebody to go out and be jumping 60 centimetres, is just as important as somebody going and jumping off for the gold medal at the Olympic Games. I think that needs to be really, really clear in everyone's mind is that, you know, if that's a goal, that's just as important a goal. And here I was back at Crossrails (laughs) on a Welsh mountain pony. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Now, we've talked about Carl Urinac being, um, you know, pivotal in your life. Who else has influenced you? Who else? Oh, look, I think my mum has been an amazing inspiration. She's not only a brilliant horsewoman who lived through the tough times in depression living on a property in Colorinabri. She ran this huge riding school, brilliant horsewoman. So she's obviously a very major inspiration in my life, as well as Carl Urinac, uh, Carolyn Lieutenant. I trained with Carolyn for many years, Vince Corvey and John Fay. Mm-hmm. Two brilliant horsemen that have been influential in my training. And um, I guess I can't not mention my husband, John, who and his father, Colin, brilliant horsemen. And they took me from, I, I started riding Colin's horse as an eventer. I was an eventer. My horse broke down. I then got him to ride. They learned him to ride and put me from an eventer to Grand Prix. So mm-hmm. really, John and Colin were probably, in my show jumping career, they taught me everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, brilliant Mm -hmm. horsemen and coaches, all excellent horse people. What about horses? Well, I've got to say my beautiful black thoroughbred, Dylan, he was my show jumping Mm -hmm. teacher. He was a little bit of a sensitive, messed up, not the most talented horse in all the world when I started riding him. Cole gave him to me to ride to see maybe a girl might settle him down. Mm -hmm. And he became my teacher just went, okay, mate, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. And he goes, well, I'm pretty frightened about what I'm doing. (laughs) So we both came through together. And I think he taught me how to deal with horses. He taught me how to listen to horses to say, how would you like to be trained? Okay. So he was amazing. Sinkenberg, the horse I was on the national squad. My husband's Zani, a little 15 two-hand horse that we travelled Australia with and he just won everything. He was an amazing, amazing little fellow. Mm -hmm. So those horses have been, and Clooney, another little 15-2 mare that I rode for a while, was very fortunate to ride, little 15-2-hand dynamos. Okay. I've got to admire them. And for a while there, you were doing quite a few shows. Was it 48 shows a year? How many shows was it? Yes, we did 52 weeks in the year. We did about 48 shows a Mm -hmm. year, so... I used to look forward to May, uh, the end of May, beginning of June every year because that's when all the horses got turned out and we could have a bit of a life (laughs) other than horses. (laughs) Okay. But that was it. That was it. I enjoyed any moment of it. but Certainly what you call uh, a full-time 
riding training. It was. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Now, what's been your proudest moment? I'd have to say, from a show jumping point of view, it would have to be winning the Australian Grand Prix on my mm-hmm. beautiful black horse Dylan, mm-hmm. who um, was not the most careful horse in the world, but he won it. And then going on and winning the Grand Prix at Sydney Show a couple of years later, I think I needed to sort of win something else to prove that that was not such a fluke. Mm -hmm. But really and truly, I must say my proudest moments have been coaching disabled riders. We had a solidified girl who had no arms who actually rode Dylan, my black horse, and I helped her do a – she was an English girl, came over and – um. She did the demon- jumping demonstration in Clements Dirks Indoor at Dural when we lived there. That was, yeah. I think, one of my proudest moments. And another one was I worked with a little girl, cerebral palsy girl, who had no trunk control. She would just lean right forward in her wheelchair. And a few years later, when I was competing at Sydney Show, she came down the alleyway, and here she was sitting bolt upright in her chair coming down to say hello. Yes. Wow. They are Mm-hmm. Amazing, yes, amazing mm-hmm. moments. And that's better than winning anything as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, helping disabled people achieve their goals. Mm-hmm. And that's been, you know, I mean, I'm thinking from your mother who was the founder of RDA in New South Wales. Yes. Yeah, that's sort of something she'd be proud of too, that you've been able to help those people. Mm. Yes, yeah, no, she she did amazing. I, I had a good teacher. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, you've been coaching for a long time. What's something that you see related to show jumping, a problem that people have that you can teach them how to fix it and then talk about how to fix that problem or how to teach them, train train them to work with that? I think it's like the same with anything. Everyone makes – I feel that they make everything too complicated. Mm-hmm. One of my favourite sayings, which I probably learned when I was at university learning about exercise science, is – that you just replicate the end task. Like as a jumper, we just need to follow a pattern at a particular pace on a particular line. We don't need to be drilling the horses to say, I need you to do a brilliant flying change here. I don't need you to have your head between your legs. I don't need to have you, you know, looking particular way, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just replicate the end task. Just repeat, make it simple and just go and practice it. Okay. But don't make it so complicated and don't drill the poor horses all the time with things that they don't need to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I see that a lot. Okay. Yes, good okay. basic horsemanship. All right, and that sort of goes back to your favourite quote, Roger Lyon, Roger Pace. Yes, that's yep. it. Yep. Yes, follow the pattern. Okay. Yep. Oh, hang on a sec. Let me interrupt to let people know about the horse industry qualifications at onlinehorsecollege.com. If you have a look at the flexible options, there's online theory and the practical components can be completed by video or with a qualified expert in your area. That website again is onlinehorsecollege.com. Okay, thanks. All right, Michelle, you're doing some complimentary work now with the physical and psychological reactions under pressure for riders. Can you speak a bit more about the work that you're doing there, assisting riders with those pressures? Yes, I think the one thing that I did learn doing exercise science at university was that any athlete performance is just about the physical. It's about the emotional and the psychological So we need to ascertain what sources of pressure from just, you know, travelling to the show, what's happening at the show, what's happening in training, what are things that might sabotage your performance. So once you sort of ascertain what sources of pressure they feel, you can put strategies in place to either improve the physical training, improve the um, mental and psychological training, the emotional training, and just put strategies in place for that. There's a lot of strategies out there, but it's one dimension will actually uh, cause people to fail, and a lot of times it's not just the physical. Okay. So, in, yeah, sources of pressure. Mm. Okay. So they've really got to identify the pressure, and then you can work on fixing the pressure. Yeah. Yep. No, I understand yes. that. Okay. Yes, I think I think it's very important. Shelley, have you got? A book that you can recommend for our listeners? I guess, I mean, I've learned by experience, but one book that I particularly like is Sons Moringa's Let Horses Be Horses. Yes. I yes. think he, yeah, that sums up, you know, like they're horses. Let them be horses. Mm, mm. <laughs> and the other one is anything by 
any book by Ray Hunt. He's an excellent horseman, so anything that you can learn from a horsemanship point of view, I think, is vitally important. Okay, good, good. All right. Now, you've been working a lot, you know, with disabilities and with your mother, and what does your future hold there? Are you doing any more work with riders with disabilities, any work with your own students? What What are your plans? Yeah, I think, I mean, I want to try to continue being the best show jumping coach I can and assisting my clients to achieve their goals. But I'm so incredibly fortunate to be working as an exercise physiologist and teaching sports science to my students here Mm. at our college. But I also facilitate a program working with falls prevention, stroke and injury rehab with my students. We go off campus to a facility And it is such a rewarding occupation. Two days a week, I'm working with my students, teaching them how to do rehab. Yep. And we're, you know, we're having some major, major achievements with people that have had strokes and injuries and falls and balance. So I'm incredibly lucky. I've got two amazing jobs, both very rewarding, but working in rehab is wonderful. Good, good. Shelley, can you sum up your philosophy? into a lesson today for our listeners? Look, I have this philosophy stuck to the side of my computer in a bookmark, so Mm -hmm. I see it every day. Yes. My favourite saying is, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I think this works very well in life and with horses and riders. So I'd have to say that's my philosophy. I think that's a good one. That's certainly one that we can go away and think of today, you know, just to spend time thinking and mulling over that. That's good. Now, how can people contact you, Shelley? We have a website, CK Equestrian. My email, Shelley at ckequestrian.com okay. or my mobile, mm-hmm. which you've got. Yep, I've got that. And we'll put that on your page at horsechats.com slash Michelle Kelly. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Michelle, thank you very much for having a chat to us today. It's been great. I'm sure that people will be very inspired now to listen to some of the stories that you've had, the work that you're putting in to do with your show jumping. So it wasn't a mistake that you have won multiple Grand Prix and won the Australian Grand Prix. That's just not a mistake. It's something goes back to those 48 shows a year and the hours and hours and the saddle that you've got. It's... It's not, that, it's not that you're lucky, it's that you put the work in to get there. Yeah, so thanks very much for that, Michelle. I'm sure that you've inspired some people. Thank you so much, Glenis, and thank you very much to Horse Chat. Okay. Thank Bye. you again. Bye. Bye. Oh, wait, before you go, if you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.